All right, welcome everyone. Welcome Work It community. Welcome to everyone joining us on Zoom and everyone streaming live on our YouTube. My name is Max Backer and I am your community manager. Our chat on Zoom is open. Our Q&A is open. Please go ahead and say hello in the chat if uh, you like. And uh, this is a Work It Health speaker series event. Tonight we welcome Frederick Chagag. What is your legacy from homelessness and addiction to college and advocacy? And I have the privilege of introducing you to Frederick. Frederick is a man who knows all too well about the struggles of this world. In his early 20s, he watched his future dreams fade away as substance use and mental illness took over his life. The next decade of his life would be a rough one, but he would not only emerge from that pain, but would also transform his life to help others overcome their own. In 2018, Freddie founded his own motivational speaking company, The Message, LLC. He started this company because he wanted to make a difference in this world. He wanted to sell hope for a living. He has come so far from rock bottom where he once found himself living, and he enjoys knowing that this is only the beginning. In recovery, Freddie had found himself with achievements and honors that he could never have imagined when he was living on the streets. And through all of this, Freddie remains humble and gracious, saying he is thankful for this opportunity to help others who are still struggling find success also. And on a personal note, Freddie is one of the most engaging speakers I have ever encountered. It's one thing to tell your story. It's another to take the audience along with you on your journey. We are all in for an incredible experience tonight. Y'all, please welcome Freddie Chigog. Oh, bless you. You're way too kind. <laughs> You're awesome. Okay. So listen, right? It's been a while since I did Zoom. Um, I'm used to usually speaking in person, right? Um, but then like the pandemic happened to Zoom and all stuff. Okay, so first let me say this. The work in health, bless you. Um, Max, bless you. Um, the fact that y'all have been nothing but supportive since my days at Delaware County. Um, you know, just uplifting, always allowing me a platform to share my troops. Uh, which, the work that you're doing is, is, is transformational. You're what rehab should look like in my opinion. Um, I just really thank y'all. I thank y'all for who y'all are, what y'all doing. And I'm I'm deeply grateful that y'all have invested in me and asked me to share my story. Okay. So my name is Frederick Chagall. I go by Freddie. I only get called Frederick when I don't take out the trash and I get on Kim's nerves. You will find out who Kim is. That is my new wife. She's a wonderful. She's a blessing. I say new as if like we've been together for a month. Okay. Here's the deal, people. Let me be very clear. I'm very happy about this speaking engagement because I normally speak in schools. That's my sort of bread and butter. But this one I'm really excited about because on here I can really dig in to the addiction part, to the mental illness part, to what it took to go from that to where I'm at now, right? Because it was a journey. It was a real journey. Like, let me be very clear. None of this happened overnight. I never believed I was good enough. I never thought I'd be here. I never thought it was even possible to be doing what I'm doing. Not If you would have told me 15, 20 years ago, Freddie, you won't be traveling all around the country. You won't be eating all types of different foods. You won't be meeting all types of people. You won't speak in DC. You won't do this. You won't do that. I'd have told you you're crazy. But God had other plans. Okay. So let, let's start back, right? I remember, right? <laughs> I was in, I've been, I, I've been to so many treatments institutions, I couldn't even tell you how many I've been. I, I don't, who knows? Okay. So I will never forget the one before the last one. I'm in there and I'm having a ball, right? Like I'm in treatment and I'm doing me and got me a little girlfriend in there and all that, right? And I'm having a good time. And, and I'll never forget the guy says to me, he says, uh, Freddie, counselor, he said, let me talk to you. I said, what's up, man? He said, you're having a good time, huh? I said, yeah. So I'm it in here. I said, you know, I'm sober. I'm feeling well. And you know, I, mean? I got a question for you. I said, what? He said, I noticed that you're playing. You're having a good time. You got your little girlfriend in there. And they tell you not to date in there, by the way. Like, what are you doing? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, that's your question. I said, what? He said, you're in treatment and you're having all this fun. 
You ever ask yourself, who's doing your kid's science homework tonight? Have you ever asked yourself, like, you do realize because you're irresponsible and because you're not doing the things you need to be doing, your girl is now at home taking care of these kids. But you having fun in treatment. And, and it didn't really hit me, right, that I didn't understand because I was spiritually sick, that I didn't understand that I was fighting for my life. Like, like I have been I have a disease and it's OK. All right. It, it, it's not a shame to have it. It's OK. But I didn't understand that. So let's start from the beginning. Let me be clear, people. I was a mess as a child. Mess. A, 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 a complete mess. Now, you wouldn't notice because the way I presented was well. I was very lucky growing up. OK, let me be clear. I was very lucky. I had a mother that went to treatment. One time for five days. She went to treatment one time for five days. And she never relapsed. My mom never got high again. Pure miracle. Okay. On top of that, she was a social worker and she worked in the field. So in my home, it was normal to have the DSMV book around. In my home, it was normal to talk about mental health in my home. It was normal that my mom took meds. It was normal in my home that my mom went to AA. But my home in the world is two different things. See, we live in a society where stigma outweighs education. We live in a society where it's weird to talk about your mental health, where it's odd to talk about the things you go through. But in my home, I have made it very normal. My granddaughter knows. Listen, the other day I'm hugging and playing with her. I was like, wait, Papa, I've got to take his medicine. Absolutely. We make it normal. I am not making it odd in my home. I am making it normal to talk about mental health. Because if it's normal to talk about the cars you got, if it's normal to talk about the degrees you got, if it's normal to talk about all your family stuff, then it should be normal to talk about your illnesses. Because we don't make it an issue to talk about diabetes. We don't make it an issue to talk about cancer. We don't make it an issue to talk about if your bones break. So why is it an issue if we're talking about a disease of the mind? It's not. We've let society dictate what our houses should look like. We've allowed society and shame to dictate. We've downloaded that and we shouldn't. And I know in my culture, which I love, we don't talk about it because for some reason it's odd. The other reason we don't talk about it is we're so up against so many barriers as a, a people of color in this country that we're fighting so much that we can't deal with this because we know the system isn't made for us. History tells us that. So we don't want to talk about it. But in my home, it's normal. So growing up, it's me and my mom. Now, let me be clear, okay? My family's Jerry Springer in real life, okay? It, it, like, listen, it's all dysfunction. There are people in my family that are great inventors, great writers, great people that have done unbelievable things that have helped make this world be better. And also, like every other family, we got stuff going on. We are like every other family in America. We got dysfunctional stuff going on. We got folks in jail, folks in psych units, folks in crack. Folks. Listen, we, we, we got everything going on in our family, all right? It is what it is. I am a normal American family with all types of dysfunction. The only thing normal about us is setting on a dryer. That's what I heard somebody say one day. Like, so I don't, I'm not ashamed, okay? Like, it is what it is, all right? I got a mom that got sober when I was a kid. My dad is not sober now. I'm here to tell you, he did not raise me. I didn't mean him until I was like, I think 18, 19, something like that. We have a relationship right now and we're getting along. For the first time in my life, we have a legit relationship where we are getting along, where we are talking, where we have a real conversation. And I can't tell you how good it feels. I can't tell you how good it feels to like hear him say on the phone, I love you, son. Because there was a time where that just wasn't possible. And listen, he's not sober and that's okay. Like I've learned, like, listen, I got boundaries. Okay. And some of my boundaries, we've talked and we set it up, but I'm proud of him. I love him. And I love the fact that me and him now, like I can sit here and tell you, like, I have a dad and like, know that like we have a relationship. It's a gift. Okay. So growing up, right. It's me and my mom. Now let, let me set the stage. My mom is a single parent woman of color in sobriety that has bipolar. I have a mother that has bipolar. It is what it is. Okay. My granddad steps in, bless his soul. He steps in, gives up his life to raise me. On top of that, because my mom's a single parent, 
I've learned in my experience as an only child, you rely on the community for help. So I was fortunate and blessed that I had uncles and I had aunts that stepped in. So my childhood from the outside looking in, I had all this, I had everything possible. I had all types of shoes. I had all types of food. I, well, my wife could tell you I, I'm the most pickiest human being ever. I mean, it's so bad. Like I, it, like I, I just, it, it's so bad. My food thing. Don't ask me about food. Cause with most people like I don't anyway, I grew up financially I had everything I had every video game I had this I didn't want for nothing financially I didn't want for anything but please hear me on this and me and my mom have had deep conversation about this she has told me that she wishes she could have spent more time but her perspective and thinking back then was look you're in an all-white predominantly school it's racist and I need the teachers to pay you attention. And I need you to get the certain treatment so that you could be ahead of the pack. And the only way I thought that that would work was by financially putting you in a situation where you could stand out. I'm sad that my mother had to make that type of choice. But as I've traveled the country speaking at schools, that's not an uncommon story. See, a person of color in this world, we come in automatically. I learned this. The social determinants of health. I didn't learn this talk. So I'm, I'm in grad school. I'll graduate my master's next year. There's this thing called the social determinants of health. I didn't even know just being born a certain color and a certain social economic status, being born to parents with a certain background automatically statistically determines where you're going to end up. I've just been real fortunate and I've been blessed by angels that I didn't end up that statistic. But the way it is set up in this country, if you're born poor and you're a person of color, good luck. And that's just how it is. And this ain't my opinion. This ain't what I'm saying. This is statistical fact. So stage is set. Okay, look, I got everything possibly I can ever ask for financially. I got every, I got every, I, you, I couldn't ask for nothing else. Here's what I learned. So I had to, I had the 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 blessing and the gift of I, I'm on a board up in Boston. I'm on a nonprofit board. And I spoke up at uh Cape Cod. I was up Martha's Vineyard. And so I met this kid because I'm looking for ice cream. Everybody go, everybody can tell you I'm always looking for ice cream, right? Always looking for ice cream. By the way, DC is the best ice cream I ever had. All right, in, in Prime Rib in uh Washington, DC. I don't know how they're doing it, it was unbelievable. All right, so I go up there, right? And now understand Martha's Vineyard, Obama got a crew up there. We ate it uh his uh the restaurant where his daughter worked at uh it's called nancy's uh you know uh, uh all these people got house up there shack all these people because you're going to get there by boat or uh by boat or flight okay and i'll never forget to ask the kid that walking me around i'm like yo i'm like what are y'all doing getting high up here i'm like y'all rich like wh what's the problem i'll never forget he told me this he said mr freddie call me fred i'm getting old he said what people don't understand when you're born in this type of money your parents don't raise you, your nannies do. The second thing he said was, the men are so busy kind of make the, trying to make this generational money keep going that most of the housewives are miserable. He was like, addiction runs rampant because nobody would ever think so. We, we don't have to face the same challenges. So we got a bigger house for bigger problems. When he said that to me, it reminded me of what my daughter had told me. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Like, I, I finally is starting to get it that, you know, for a long time, I thought bigger house, better car, better looking women, more clothes, more this, more that. My life got better. No, my life didn't get better until I became a better person. So it didn't matter what I look like. It didn't matter what I wear. It didn't matter what I had. All that stuff is outside. Until my inner soul was right, there was no good fruit. So when I look back at my childhood, yes, I had everything possible. Yes, I looked apart. Yes, I could speak. Yes, I had this. But inside, I was a mess. Man, listen, from the age of, I'll say, third grade when my mom went to treatment, I'd say around then, to probably 14, 15, I was abused. Even, it ain't even questionable from physical abuse in the neighborhood to sexual abuse that was going on to, to I mean, the microaggressions in the schooling, right? All that stuff. And when I look back, 
And I think like, wow, like I went to my first psych unit as a preteen. I went to all these, I went to rehab as a, as a, as a teen. Okay. Like I was in all these different institutions. You know, my mom's going through all this and you know, people always say, what's wrong with Freddie? I don't understand what's going on with him. But you know what? Nobody ever asked what happened to you. Nobody ever asked that question. Like when we look at these kids and they're struggling, right? But like I've been blessed. I didn't spoke in Memphis. I spoke all these places, talk to kids. We're all asking, what's wrong with this youth? I don't understand these kids, blah, blah. But we're never asking what happened or who raised them, right? Like we don't ask these questions, right? We just automatically deflect and take it off. Well, here's what I'm willing to tell you. I was a child and if you knew me, you would think I was happy because the way I presented made it look well. Well, guess what? That's a symptom of mental illness. Mental illness, one of the symptoms is to manipulate the situation. It's like television. I tell you a vision. I'm not going to tell you I'm getting bullied. I'm not going to tell you what's going on with me. One, I'm not in a household that's set up for that. My mom is tired. She's a single parent woman in sobriety, woman of color. She's trying to provide. She's trying to make sure I got. She's trying to take care of child care. She's trying to keep food on the table. Dealing with her own mental illness. Dealing with her own bipolar. Dealing with the fact that she got to take meds. And in our family, like most that I've seen, we ain't talking about this at Sunday dinner. I haven't seen most families. Then it's Sunday dinner. You can raise your hand and say, hey, how's everybody doing? Good. I just got out of the psych unit. I'm now taking Prozac. I didn't grow up like that. I haven't seen one of them. Now, in my house, it's normal, but that's not what I've seen. So my point to you is, and I tell people this all the time, never confuse busyness with production. Yeah, I was going to camps and, yeah, you know, at times my grades was good, but eventually my behavior started coming out. Because when we look back, we weren't asking the right questions. It, it, we weren't dealing with the right type of things. I now know that now, and now I'm blessed to talk about it. So to you parents on here, to you people that have households that are dealing with children, listen to me and hear me well, please. Have the right conversations. I have a time with my daughter that I tell her from the door, she calls me, Dad, I, I just did this. I just passed this class. I got this job. I got this car. I got it. And I don't care about none of that. I know you're intelligent. I know you're smart. I know you're going to produce. What I need to know is how are you? How's your soul doing? What's going on with you? All that other stuff, we can get to that. But you can't get to that if you're not based on a healthy foundation. So you can forget the car. You can forget the car's degree. You can forget all those wonderful things unless you are healthy. And that's what I've learned now. So I'm getting abused. I'm going through all this mess. I'd have been my first psych unit. I'm young, preteen, teen, whatever. Okay. And nobody ever asked, like, what is it like to go to a psych unit as a kid and have to go back to the same environment? Here's what I'm here to tell you. It's horrible. It's horrible. You know, and, and that's what I was going through as a kid. All right. Fast forward. Now, let me be clear about something. I am blessed to be in a healthy relationship. Let me tell you what I learned about relations. Oh, let me hit this out. Let me tell you what I learned about relations. Healthy people are not attracted to unhealthy people. How do I know? Because all the women I had before the wonderful woman I'm with now, I met in the following places. Tequila Willies, bars, uh, you know, Johnny's Tavern, behavioral health institutions. Um, I don't know, psych units, you know, places where they tell you, ah, you might not want to date in there. See, what I've learned is the reason I got unspiritual women is because I had unspiritual written on my forehead. So I got everything that came with that. So I ended up being with somebody for a long time. Stuck into the kid's life. Uh, she had a daughter. I was allowed to raise her. We got custody of her brother's kids. And listen, because I didn't take care of my issues, my issues took care of me. Now, you wouldn't know, right, because we presented well. Nice house and suburb, dog, cat. We look like the typical, wonderful, we're making a family. But come on in this house. I was an absolute terrorist. And you know what I know now? I was a child raising a child. I had absolutely no business raising a child. But you couldn't tell me that. Because at that point, I thought I was a good dad because my kids had Jordans on their feet. See, I thought I was a good dad because how my kids look. What I've learned about parenting is, number one, parenting is a privilege. It's not a right. Number two, I can be replaced. Number three, what I've learned about parenting is that my job is to uplift them in soul, time, direction, wisdom. What I financially provide them 
It's not even remotely as important as what I provide them in time and with love and with care. I had to learn the hard way. And I was in and out of treatment. And I wasn't listening. You couldn't tell me nothing. And I didn't want to follow the directions. Listen, let me be very clear about this. My bottom was ugly. So for anybody that don't know where they're going, don't know what they want to do, you know, they're, they're up and down. Let me tell you something. There's two things about human beings every day that we wake up to do. One is seek pleasure and two is avoid pain. Nobody likes pain, especially Americans. We do not like being uncomfortable. So I would highly advise anybody that's on this call or anybody that's struggling with drugs and alcohol that don't know if they want to stop or not, please hear me. Whatever is causing you the most pain in your life, you need to take a real deep, thorough look at that. Because what I've learned is what causes me pain, I need to get away from. So I was in and out, in and out, in and out. And finally, my bottom came. And listen, I'm not going to go over everything horrible that I've ever done in, in my addiction. I mean, listen, watch watch TV. All right. You want to know how bad it got? It got terrible. Everything you can imagine. I did it all. It was horrible. It was it was rotten. But I'll take you in once. Anybody that knows me that knows there's no fighter in me. I got bullied for years and never fought back. I am a person. If you hit me, I'm going to ask you why. That's how I'm made. I'm not made to fight. This is not how God made me. I just, I'm not made that way. And I'm okay with it. For a while, it bothered me. It don't no more. I'm not made that way. It does not make me weak because I don't fight. It doesn't. I fight with my mind. That's who I am. Okay. Boom. I remember when my ex told me it was over. And I was like, what do you mean? You know, what do you mean? She's like, I'm done with this, friend. We're not doing this no more. No, it's not that. I end up putting my hands on her. Now, if you know me, right? Like, if you know me. It's against every four, it's against every moral fiber to put my hands on a woman. But about the next one, I will. Because that's where I go when I'm spiritually sick and I am filled with alcohol and drugs. That's how my mind and my spirit reacts. I do not think rationally. So I end up putting my hands on her in front of the children. Think about what I'm telling you. If you know me, that's not even how I, how I am made. That's not even how I think. That's not even how I move. But that's what drugs and alcohol do to my spirit. It changes my morality. So I end up moving out to Philly. And listen, when I came out here, right, something I need to tell y'all. I learned something about me in Philly. And, and here's what it is. Money was the deodorant for the stench of my soul. What do I mean by that? See, money would allow me to look a certain way. I, I, was, teach, I was teaching uh, men how to read and write. I was playing drums at the local church. I'm teaching, I'm teaching Sunday school. You know, I'm dressing well. I'm looking, man, I, I see money hides. It's like the deodorant that covers all the warts, right? Well, I get on the phone, I call my mom. I'm only child. I always call my mom. You know, whatever we're going through, I always call my mom. You know, it's my mom. Yeah, what up? What friend? Yo, I'm out Philly. I'm good. What? Man, listen, I'm out here. I'm getting money. Oh, that man got me an apartment. Will, I'm doing it, man. I'm, I'm looking good, smelling good. I'm on my way downtown right now. Going to get steak and shrimp, play the muscles, all that, man. You need some money? I'm out here, baby. What's cracking with you? Told my ex it's on her. I'm out here, good. And I'll never forget she told me. She said, Freddie, you can dress a pig all you want. He's still a pig. And she hung up. What I didn't realize at that time is I can obtain anything, but I never maintain it because it's built on spiritual trash. So everything it took to build in like a year, I end up losing like four months. And almost seven years ago, I end up downtown, homeless, dumpster diving, begging for change. Yeah, I remember the lady from Dunkin' Donuts putting the donuts on top of the dumpster. And I remember eating out of them thinking it wasn't that bad and had money in my pocket. Like I remember, right? Like people walking past me. I remember being laughed at. Like I remember, man. Right. Like I remember sleeping on the sewer. Like I remember the rats running over me. Like I remember all that. I remember when it was raining and I was downtown and I hadn't had a shower in days and I was peeing on myself. Like I remember all that. Right. Like I never forgot that. But let me tell you where my bottom hit. I'm downtown. Right. And a white lady. I'm only saying white because I don't know her name. So she walks past me. So I had this thing that I'm going to beg for change by the rich calling. Because I think I thought about begging for change by the rich or rich. You know what I mean? Coming out here and me money. No, give me money when I was homeless. It was a single parent woman at the bus stop with her last 20 with her three kids. Facts. 
So one walks past me. I got my hand out. I said, hello. You know, obviously I'm having a very bad day. I'm having some money. She looks at me. She spits on me. Then she says, get a job. I thank her. Everybody says, what do you mean? Let me tell you why I thank her. Listen, man, it's sports season. It's just a Super Bowl, right? Hear me. Follow me. You don't think that I get triggered? You don't think it goes to my mind, man? Packers on Sunday night. You give me a case of that Heineken. Now they got that pure white henny out. Give me some shots of Tron. Call, man, give me a good ounce of that good onion. See what some of that sour look. I don't know what they smoke now. I, some of that blueberry. You know what I mean? But then I think, okay, Freddie, you can have a good Sunday night. But are you willing to risk being spit on a car? Because you see what happens when you use. It puts you in that type of situation. Is it worth it? So that thought of Sunday night football with steak and honey and Patron, it goes in the left ear and comes out the right because I realize where it can take me. So I thank that woman because I truly believe had not had that type of pain, I would have never stopped. So for those of you that may have not experienced that type of pain, I would tread very lightly with drugs and alcohol because if you would have told me years ago that would have happened, I would have told you you were crazy. So. I end up in treatment. A man finds me. And I'm passed out drunk. I thought I had died, to be honest. And he finds me. I say to him, I say, yo. He stops. I say, listen, man, let me die. So I'm not good at life. I failed at life. I'm a horrible human being. I don't deserve to be here. I'm a nobody. I'm stupid. I'm bad. I've been bullied my whole life. I just was a mistake. My parents didn't make everything. Get, just let me die right here. I'm cool with dying right here. He said, brother. You ain't dying today. He gave me a pillow and a bottle of water. Angel, don't know who he is, never seen him again. I wish I do. I, I've been speaking. Hopefully one day I speak at the White House, he'll finally show up somewhere. I, Angel, he prayed me, gave me a bottle of water. Boom, I hit treatment center. I get in the treatment. I'll never forget this. Brother here, I love him to death. We're in a basement. I'm in a basement of the treatment center, living room. And this time when I got the treatment, I don't have nothing. I didn't even have shoes. So we're in there, we're going through clothes. They had a clothing donation. So we're going through clothes, right? We went through the clothes and he looks at me. He said, okay, you're going to pick out underwear. I was like, who? And then I thought about it. I'm in the middle of the woods in the treatment center and I'm going through the underwear and I'm picking out the ones that aren't stained. Freddie, like, are you done? What does it take? So I call mom because I always call mom. Mom, I'm done. I quit. I swear I'm going to change my life. Never forget she said this. She said, Freddie, I hope I didn't get sober to bury you because I will. Now I gotta tell you, I'm on child, okay? That hurt, but it's what I needed. Listen, if you're parenting somebody with this illness, I believe there's multiple ways to parent, but let me be very clear about this. It's unnatural parenting because in parenting, when your kid is hurting, you have to soothe and love and care about them. But in my experience, in my time with this, pain is what is needed to get to the other side. Now there's levels to it. I'm not saying, you know, throw them off a bridge. Duh, use our brains. But what I am saying is it's unnatural. For a kid to learn how to ride their bike, they probably got to fall and scrape their knees. The, the, the thing with this, the illness that I've learned and I've seen in my experience is the parent got to get out the way. And, 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 and basically what that means is you can steal love by allowing them to grow. Letting them grow is love. So if your kid is showing behaviors like I was showing, where every time I touch something, I did more. People always ask me, Freddie, what'd you go to rehab for? Here's your answer, more. The first time I ate Captain Crunch, I ate so much. My mom had to stop buying it. I ate so much, I threw up. My mom caught me eating Nestle quick, all right? The first thing I got high off was not drugs and alcohol. The first thing I ever got high off was my asthma inhaler. She brought it home. It was and Vance room. I shook it up. I took it. I started shaking. I was like, oh. Listen, it felt like my first hit of crack. That was the first thing I got high off of, my asthma inhaler. Not no 40, not marijuana. In order to know these things, talk to your children. Have conversation with them. My mom didn't know what's going on because my household wasn't built for her to know what's going on. Because she's single, black, and in recovery and trying to put food, bread, and water on the table. She don't have time to sit down and talk to me about different theories. She don't have time to go over that stuff. On top of that, she's getting heat from trying to raise me. On top of that, she's in a racing environment. So no, we weren't set up to deal with my issues. That's why I believe I have this job to help others get through these issues.
so that you ain't got to go through the pain me and my mother went through. So you ain't got to go through the pain me and my father went through. So you ain't got to go through the pain that me and my family go through to this day about drugs and alcohol. I want y'all to be better. I want y'all not to experience the things I went through. I don't want no kid in no psych unit as a child. I don't want no kid in no rehab. That's why I'm doing this. So parents can stop crying. They can stop burying their kids. So we don't have to keep going through the same stuff. That's why I'm doing this. I just so happen to get blessed that they pay you for this. But for real, for real, this don't even feel like a job. It feels like what I'm supposed to be doing. So, all right, go to rehab. And I stopped counting my days. I started making my days count. I get out. Let me tell you what happened. Something clicked. I get out of rehab. Boom. I entered Delaware County Community College. And let me be clear about this. Before I got to Delaware County Community College, I started hanging out my wife now. Her name is Kim. Beautiful human being. Now, Kim is 54, I'm 40. I can only say her age because she's not in the house right now. She's actually speaking in a meeting herself. And this is being recorded. So when she hears this, she's going to be very, very pissed. But, you know, she loves me. I love her. It is what it is. Okay. So my wife is also white. And I mentioned that because we are the poster child of judgment. So my wife is 54, I'm 40. My daughter's 26. We got two older children. So people look at us crazy. Like, we, you know, but I, I, listen, let me be clear about this too. I've been on judgment my whole life. From classism to being black, to not being black enough, to not caring about black folks enough, to caring about too much, to not doing it the right way in treatment, to my recovery ain't right, so I shouldn't be getting paid for speaking, to da 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 Been doing with judgment my whole life. And my pastor told me, they hung Jesus. What makes you different? So it is what it is. You're going to wake up to judgment. If you ain't getting no judgment, you ain't really popping yet. So, hey, it is what it is. Okay. So, you know, we get together and we're hanging out. We're going to meetings and we're doing this. And finally, one day I say, you know, Kim, I really love you, but this ain't going to work. She said, what are you talking about? I said, Kim, you have more than me. You're a homeowner. You're a graduate of college. You have degrees. You have a good salary paying job. I'm in a shelter with nothing. Like this is over. She said, Freddie, it's not about what you have. It's about who you are. Now, listen, I had never met a female that looked at soul before they looked at resume. I had never met a female that cared about who I was over what I do for a living. I was like, for real? You really let me? She said, yeah. She said the job and the resume stuff, that ain't guaranteed, but being who you are is. Let's go. So I signed up for it. Best decision I ever made in my life. So I go to Delaware County Community College. I go, I take my placement test first day there. Now, mind you, let me be clear. At high school, I got a 7-10 on my SATs. I fell out of six colleges. Okay, I'm not a first-time winner. I fell out of six colleges. I did, not, I did not make the most likely to succeed list. I wasn't on that. But the way it's looking, the way things are going, it's not most likely to succeed. I set a new bar. It's most likely to get a statue. I've changed how things are. So for those of you that might not make that most likely succeed, for those of you in high school that's getting looked at, that's getting laughed at, that's getting talked bad about that, don't pay that no mind. Because trust me when I tell you this, can't nobody stop the blessings that God got coming. So why I might be getting laughed at, why I might have been getting bullied, why I might have been going through all that other stuff, God was seasoning me for my season, which is right now. So all that pain I went to turned into glory. What I used to be ashamed about, they now pay me for. So listen, just keep going through it. There's a reason you're here. Don't ever let nobody tell you why. So, okay. I take my placement test. Right. And it was tic-tac-toe. I just, whatever. I get down my placement test. Lady tells me I tested remedial. I'm all happy because I think remedial mean AP class. All right, bet. I get out of AP. I get out of there and find out it's not AP. And so I go. My first English class was English 025. She said she wanted us to write a paper on identity and talk about who we were. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. Yeah. So I wrote in there about being homeless, dumpster diving, all that. And for the first time, I was feeling empowered about telling my story and not letting anybody define my success. For the first time, I was allowing myself to speak freely. And I got to be honest about this. I remember growing up, my mother having to attend psych unit a few times, right? And I remember when she came home, when we would all sit down at Sunday dinner, that we'd not dare bring that up. But we could talk about our accolades, but we couldn't talk about our health. And I remember watching her and I remember feeling that shame that she had. And for the first time, I felt like 
I had an opportunity to break that. And so I did. And before I knew it, that ended up on the front page of the Philadelphia op-ed section inquiry. Think about what I just told you. I went from being laughed at, talked bad about all the things I went through in rehab, all the things I went through. And now I'm on the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer op-ed section. Wow. It's me, my daughter, and my wife. We should down Jersey. We go down to New Jersey and go get a place called Boss Pancakes. Food is unbelievable. Pancakes is one of the favorite things I love to eat. We go down there. We go to this uh, meeting. It's a meeting on the beach. It's real spiritual. It's beautiful. And I go to the store. I, I bought a whole bunch of them. And I open it up. My daughter leans back. She's like, that's dope. You know what that felt like? So then, here we go. Before I knew it, school calls me in New Jersey and says, hey, we, we read this story. It's unbelievable. We'd love to pay you to come speak. I was like, y'all pay people for this? They was like, yeah. They was like, what's your price? I said, I don't know. I got to call my mentor. Before I knew it, life had changed. But before I get into I end with my blessings, I want to explain to you something that happened to me that I believe changed my whole director of my recovery. My first advisor, Rose Kurtz, had me in her office. She sat me down. Now, at this time when I met her, I was strictly 12 step. Now, I want to be clear. I'm going to be clear about this. Please hear me. I grew up in a household of strict AA. We don't think outside that way. We don't look outside that way. That's what got my mother sober. I'm thankful to God it did because it gave me a childhood because had that happened, I probably would have went to CYS or my granddad would have raised me or I'd have been all over the place in the system. I am grateful for the fellowship. Two things can be true. Let me be very clear about this. We, I, I, a good brother, Devin, I forget his last name, said this. We can't recover if we die. The world has changed. Drugs have changed. The youth is different. The youth growing up now are not growing up in 1963. They grew up with social media, they grew up with cell phones, and they grew up with all types of different issues that older generations did not grow up in. I had to learn when I started speaking at these schools that I had to wake up. The first thing traveling and meeting other people did was expose my ignorance. And I had to sit down and listen and start reading and realizing the population has changed. So I'm going to be clear. I have a mentee who is a man who wears a dress and he wears makeup. And I hang out with him and I love him. Let me tell you why. There was a time that I would have never hung out with him and I would have looked down on him. That was my ignorance because I would have said a person like that is shameful. What I've learned is, number one, that's not Christ-like. Number two, I remember being laughed at too. So I tell him when we go out, you be you. And when people start to look at us, I hug him and I tell him I love him. And we sit down and we eat and we fellowship. And the other day he tells me, he said, thank you, Freddie. You're like a dad to me. I appreciate you. You're the only people that don't like laugh at me. And I looked at him. I said, no, thank you. We got to embrace. One of the reasons that this country stays so messed up is because instead of looking at our similarities, Instead of looking at how we can be solution oriented, instead of looking at how we can uplift each other, it's always, why are you different? I don't want everyone to be the same. I want different hairstyles. I want different colors. I want different perspectives. I want different ways of looking at everything. I don't got to agree with you to love you. And I don't have to agree with you and be disrespectful. Why we make this so hard? So yes, I embrace all forms of recovery. If you smoke weed, if you drink, if you do MAT, if you do whatever that, I love you and I thank you for who you are because your recovery is defined by you. We got to stop allowing other people to have the moral authority to say what recovery is. And let me tell you why I know. You ever see the stats on these rehabs lately? One out of 10 of you will make it. They used to say that to me all the time. You know, one out of 10 on this building is going to make it. Um, let, me, let me think about this. So imagine going to the doctor and I say, hey, I've the oncologist told me I have chemo. Well, you know, sir, one out of 10 people that take this get well. Or I have, you know, an illness. And they say, well, here's the medicine. One out of 10 people this works on. If you told me that, I'd fight my doctor. So my point is, it's not the patients. It's the system. Because in America, we don't prevent health. We profit off of it. So what I'm telling you is whatever you got to do to be recovered, whatever you got to do to get well, whatever you got to do to feed your family and be well and live your life and to speak your truth, you do it. You ain't going to hear no mess from me. And listen, 
I used to be one of the people that was ignorant. I used to be one of the people that would judge you if you smoked weed. I used to be one of the people that would judge you if you said you're recovering and drank. But you know what I learned? Who am I? I who am I? As much as I've done in my closet and in my life, I ain't looking down on nobody. I want people alive. And you know where this really come from too? I've been to funerals. See, part of my job as a speaker, I get the calls of, can you help bury my daughter? I get the call to speak it. Blaine, I love her to death. She's family, legit, love her to death. On Chrissy, all them, if they're on here, bless y'all, I love y'all to death. Blaine lost her daughter. And I had the honor and privilege. I was in rehab with her. She called me and said, Freddie, I can't talk. They found her daughter. She asked me to speak at her funeral. And I'll tell you what, when we were at her funeral, it like kind of hit me like, nobody here cares about what your resume looks like. None of that stuff matters. So we need to stop having this moral authority over what recovery means. Because the reality of it is, we're losing an epidemic, bad. So until we get these statistics right and people start dying, we need to start embracing all forms because ain't nobody yet found an answer. What works for one might not work for the other. Now, me personally, I can't smoke weed. I can't do no type of drugs and I can't drink because I get different. I must take meds. I must go to therapy. I must fellowship. I must network. I got all types of meetings. A-A-C-A-N-A, whatever. I went to OA with my wife. Yes, the people in there talking about how they dug in the trash to get bananas. I might not relate to digging a trash for bananas, but I can relate to digging a trash for alcohol. Yep, I did that. So, like, I, I don't judge, man. Not about this recovery thing. Because I've seen too many parents bury their children. I've seen too many people have to bury their kids. It is incredibly, in my opinion, criminal to judge how somebody recovers. Because at the end of the day, it's about saving lives. Okay. So. Let me tell you what life looks like now. My, my advisor says, Freddie, you're intelligent, you're smart, you're going to do anything you want in this world. But in order for you to be really, really successful, I need you to clean your house up. So we did. When I first met my wife, these kids were in here smoking weed, getting high. This house was a mess. I'm here to tell you, here's what happened. Our daughter, by God's grace and mercy, just celebrated two years of sobriety last week. Yep, our daughter at one time had a methamphetamine addiction. I have no problem saying that. Absolutely. I stepped into her life at 20 some years old. I didn't raise her. No, she told me on my birthday, she sent me five cards. She said, you might not have given me life, but you made my life better. She calls me dad, didn't raise her. She don't call me dad based on biological. She calls me dad based on my parenting skill set. See, I learned anybody can have a child, but who has the parenting skill set to raise it? There's a difference. The other day, I'm talking to her on the phone. She says to me, hold on, stop talking. I said, why? She said, I've got to write it down. She respects me that much that when I talk, she listens. She's doing wonderful. I, 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 I'm so proud of her. She's in school. She's working. She's learning how to save her money. I mean, think, way, way further than I was at that age. On top of that, my wife just celebrated eight years of sobriety last week. We were in Chicago. Her whole life has changed. She's working out. Right now, as we speak, my wife's at a meeting speaking. My daughter couldn't, my wife and my daughter couldn't be on here because my wife is at a meeting speaking and my daughter's down in Florida celebrating her uh, thing. They got a big cake for her and all that. See, I grew up in a single parent home with struggles and, 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 and you know, you know, a divorce and all that other mess. I now have a two parent home, sobriety and education. I graduated on a Sunday with my bachelor's summa cum laude from Westchester University. The day before my wife graduated with her master's in healthcare administration, we're both going to sit in rooms of policy. Look at the change. I grew up in a home where it, it, it made me think monolithic about families. I didn't even want no family. Ask anybody that know me. I never wanted to get married. I never was to think about having kids because I thought marriages don't make it. See, coming from that pain, I thought single parent was the only way it was going to happen. So I said real early, man, I ain't getting married. Why? Every single parent I know is angry and miserable. All the parents I know argue and fight and they hate each other. Why would I ever want to have kids and have a family? But then God said, ah, I'm a granddad now. I got a granddaughter named Olivia. I love her to death. They say I'm nuts. I don't even let her watch TV when she come over crib. Listen, it's, it, listen it, she, it's either C-SPAN or we, we be playing with blocks, reading and all that. I started her at 529C. Because when I, when I started making money, I thought, mm, when I turned 18, it wasn't no money for me. So why would I want her to be in the same position? So all that money I'd be blowing, 
How about I put that money to make sure when she hits 18, she got something to stand on? So let me tell you, I graduated Westchester University summa cum laude selected commencement speaker. I'm now in school to get my master's. I'll get my master's next spring and I'll start my doctorate next, uh, yeah, next year. I'm going for uh, my uh, doctorate in public administration and a concentration in addiction policy. I'm now realizing that the, that the world has ran off uh, positions of policy. And most of them positions are white men sitting in them chairs that haven't been through what I've been through. So they need to have somebody that's making decisions about feeding the poor that's actually been there, been through it and done it. And I'm going to be one of them people. By God's grace and mercy, my company is absolutely hot as fish grease right now. It, my company is on fire. I just spoke in Chicago. And let me tell you, by God's grace and mercy, I'm living. Man, me and my wife went out there. Achieving the Dream had us. God bless them. Thank them. It was unbelievable. We had deep this piece and we went to the Bulls game. Listen, we looked at our taxes last night. The amount of money I spent on food last year. Listen, we've been eating ribeye steaks. Look, I, last year I was in Memphis. Then I went to South Texas College. Then I spoke down in, uh, I was at the JFF conference. I was a panelist down there. Then I spoke in New Orleans. I was down there twice. Listen, the food in New Orleans is unbelievable. It's the best food I ever had in my life. Look. I'm in Minnesota, right? The school had me out there. They let me go to a Packer game. I'm a diehard Packer fan. I go to a Packer game. They rented me a cherry drop. What? I'm downtown. I got all my uh, Packer gear on, head to toe. I'm downtown. I got the music blast. I got the J on left. I'm like, yo, what up? They're like, forget the Packers. I'm like, yo, I'm telling you. Man, I'm living. I'm living, man. I got me a dog named Gemma. She's crazy. The other day she got sprayed by a skunk. I was running around a crib. I had to get her cleaned up. I'm living. But let me tell you, let me get real here. Success didn't heal all wounds. Let me explain what I mean. My mother got diagnosed with leukemia not too long ago. And, you know, leukemia is real. We had a conversation, and I apologize for all the stuff I've done. And, you know, I told her, you know, you did a good job, Mom. You were up against a lot of barriers. It wasn't meant for you to survive in this country with, with the circumstances that we were put in. And I asked her, forgive me. And she said, Freddie, with the man that you become, I can go to my grave and sleep well. You know what that felt like to hear my mother tell me that as an only child? Because I'm gonna tell you something, growing up as an only child is fun. It absolutely sucks now. To hear my mother tell me that Freddie, with who you become, I can go to my grave and sleep well. I've had family members and cousins tell me, Freddie, you are the standard. You've broken the cycle. So listen, I'm gonna end with this. Everybody that was on here tonight, I thank you, and I'm grateful for you. But know this. I am a human being with flaws just like anybody else. I have an illness. I was born with a brain that has a chemical imbalance. I didn't met doctors that worked in labs with rats. I didn't travel to all over this country speaking. I didn't talk to all types of people from all different things. I am sold that this is an illness. And in order for me to treat my illness, it takes a certain type of life. I am a Christian. I'm very flawed. That's my belief system. Whatever you believe in, I embrace it and love you for who you are. But I'm going to tell you like this. Please, please don't put your trust in human. Because the one thing that all humans do that love me, they fail me. Not on purpose, but because they're human. So tonight when you're laying in your bed and you're thinking about this loud, crazy black kid that was on this thing screaming, I have a question. What is your legacy in life? Why are you here? What are you going to do to make it better so that the people coming behind you can have it better? I don't know about you, but I'm going to empower people to empower other people. And I'm going to continue going to these schools and I'm going to continue telling my story. I'm going to write my first book and I'm going to have my first documentary coming out and I'm going to go ahead and get my master's and I'm going to do all these things. But the truth is I ain't doing it for me. I'm doing it for the kids that don't believe that's in a group home right now that think that they don't mean nothing, think they weren't met. I'm doing it for them and so that the world can be better. We were all given gifts. Use yours to make it better. What's your legacy? Thank you for allowing me to share my story. Freddie. Oh, my goodness. Um, Freddie, you have a, a, a style uh, of speaking and engaging the audience that you cannot look away from. You can just not look away. And I feel like that almost mimics uh, the addiction epi epidemic that we have in this country. We can no longer look away. 
And uh, I've got some questions uh, coming in for you and uh, just gathering myself. Thank you. No, thank you. That was, in fact, an experience. And again, felt like I was with you uh, the entire way. Um, first one, Freddie, you are an inspiration. Tell us who are your inspirations? Obviously, family, Ooh. I know, is big, but who lights um, you up? Who keeps you going? Okay, so... Um... I'm gonna be real honest about this. Bill Clinton has a um a quote that says, I look up to other people, I look up to the people others look down on. I'm not necessarily into like the famous people. I'm into the people that don't get glory. So there's this, there's this girl, her name is Katie, and she was in one of my classes. And she's um, you know, she has some challenges that are obvious. She's a bagger at the local grocery store. And I go see her every Sunday and she sends me her dinner, a picture of her dinner every Friday. She's my inspiration because she never complains and she's so grateful just to eat out on a Friday. She's who I look up to. It's not the politicians. It's not these, you know, people in history and all that. I'm grateful for them. It's Katie. Mm. It's it, it, cause, cause you know, like she obviously has her challenges. She wouldn't know. Because her attitude, her behavior, her gratitude is just so grateful. It's Katie. Mm, I love that. It, it is. It is the regular people, right, doing this. Yeah. Um, and that's where I gather my inspiration as well. Um, uh, this is coming in from Nicole. Uh, they ask, how did you find help when you were homeless? These days, it feels impossible to ask for help. People are so judgmental and there's such a yeah. stigma. Was there a certain kind of, you know, way that, that you were able to get help? Um, that guy found me. I, I, so I, I've been blessed with the ability to talk. Like I, the other day, somebody told me, he said, don't give out uh, yourself. I said, what are you talking about? He was like, Freddie, your words cost money now. And I didn't really, I just didn't really realize that. I'm always saying that to say this. Being given this gift, I was using it way before I was speaking. So like what, with the way I am, either you're going to like me or not. Like that's just what it is. So while I was homeless, there were some people, I met some good humans that you would just help me. And like I said, that guy was an angel. He was the one that found me, called the ambulance, and then they sent me to the hospital. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. So my, my, my answer to that is, how did I find help? I didn't find help. Help found me. I got blessed. And she's right. And whoever said that, you're right. It is despicable how we're treating the homeless. There are some cities that during the thing, they do what they call cleanup where they get the homeless out. Well, just because you get them out that area don't mean they're going to be gone. They're going to go to somewhere else. And how about instead of sweeping them out, we sweeping them to a home and we give them resources and we give them help and we give them the things we need. But, you know, typical America, wealth gap. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, both addiction and, and mental health issues both tied closely into that issue, absolutely. right? And they cannot absolutely. be. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing uh, that I really enjoyed hearing about was was you growing up and, and when you were a kid. It, do you ever find yourself wishing there was something that you could tell your younger self now? Yeah. Stop caring about what people think. Be mm -hmm. you be you because at the end of the day like there's always going to be somebody who got something to say you know what i'm saying like just be yeah. you man just be you if i if i what that's what i would tell myself just be you don't be nobody else because now it's crazy i get paid to be me <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> like that's what's crazy about this whole situation i was always ashamed to be who i am and now being who i am is allowing me to feed my family and help change lives it's crazy absolutely um, one might say that's your legacy. Uh, yeah. One of yeah. one of many, uh, yeah. I think. Um, one thing you said during your talk, which which really stood out to me, was that addiction changes your morality, and and okay. we have scientific proof on that, right? That that addiction, you know, certainly harms part of the brains that you know affect decision making. It you know affect things that we might consider part of our our moral compass, and we know we may know this, but how do you did you, do you find the ability to self-forgive for some of, you know, 
the behaviors that we all do during active addiction? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So one is therapy. Um, the other thing is understanding the why behind my my reason is. Like I wasn't born. It's not like when the doctor handed me to my mom and said, hey, you know, at, at 30, Freddie's going to eat out of a dumpster. You know, at 30, Freddie's going to steal off you and, and drink beer. Like that's not how, like, that's not how I was born. It's what happened. So I had to understand that. I also understand that it's part of the behavior of the illness. Like when I started realizing this was a medical illness and stopped looking at this as a morality illness is when I was much, much easier to forgive myself. Like, yeah, there are days I wish I wouldn't have done something, of course. But overall, I'm okay with who I am. And I always tell this to people because look what it gave me. <laughs> like, that's the thing with me. Like everything I used to be so ashamed of and sad about, it now gave me a new life. So it's like hard for me to be like, man, I wish I wouldn't have did that. Oh, okay. I'll be in Chicago this month. You know, I turned pain into glory. Hmm. One of many yeah. quotes tonight, yeah. Freddie. So good. Um, got a question coming in now from Haley. Mm -hmm. What were some of your day-to-day -day practices that helped in early recovery? It's hard to get some of those days right. strung together. What were some of the things that worked for you? So one of the things that really worked for a while, I couldn't really talk to nobody I knew. I needed to stay away from everybody for a while and get my own mind right. That's number one. The second thing that worked is this pastor had told me, he said, I want you to look in the mirror every day because self-esteem has been an issue for me my whole life. I never thought I was good enough about anything. He said, I want you to look in the mirror and say, I am good enough. I am meant to be here and God loves me. I had to do that every day. And I did that every day for like almost a year. And eventually one time I just said, I don't need to do that no more. I'm good enough. That really helped. I, I, I swear that really helped. And the other thing was too, doing lovable things. So I didn't love myself. The hence why I put all the drugs and alcohol in my system because people that love themselves don't harm themselves. You know what I started doing? I started doing lovable things. I started being around people that love me. I started, I, I met a whole new village of folks that love me to death, a whole new village. I got all types of moms and aunts and you know what I mean? Like they're not blood, but they all family. Right. Like I, I started being around lovable stuff. I got an ice cream habit now. Bad. To the point where my own, uh, one of my spiritual moms, Bonnie, she got me a, a, a spoon that says Freddie's ice cream spoon. Like, you know what I mean? I, it's my sports thing. That's still what that is. Like, you know, like I started doing lovable stuff. If I'm having a bad day, I watch one of my favorite movies. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that. And my meds. Right. Right. I gotta Absolutely. Take, I got to take my segment. Taking care of that physical body. Um, Listen, you got, if it's not already do lovable things is the hashtag Freddie. My <laughs> goodness. I love, love, love that surrounding yourself in, in happiness and joy and your joy is contagious. It was a hell of a road, Freddie, yep. but you are doing such brilliant, brilliant things. And we are so lucky to have you. And it is eight on the dot. And I want to be respectful of your yes. time. Also shout out to Kim. Uh, oh, yes, you know, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing just part of your life and, and, and showing how, how it very much can work for someone. And, and also just a met one more call out to, to all the great advice uh, you gave to parents too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, because one of the things that kind of blew my mind from your, from your talk is that you're actually a, a legacy of recovery. Your whole family is a yeah. legacy of recovery. Yep. from your mom uh to all your other family members to right. to your kid now i think you said who's yep. celebrating two years uh, to your own partner i think it's just um that is such a beautiful thing so yeah we you. uh oh bless you linda thank you so much you're you're awesome she's a she's a change agent for real um yeah like um i really believe that that my story and what we've been through is, is an answer. Love. On paper, we don't look like we should all be together. But man, in real life, we all of our lives got better because we met each other. So mm. I love y'all. Work your health. I'm a fan. I got to write for y'all too. I ain't wrote for y'all in a while. I got to get back to the pen and the pad. We'll take, gotta... we'll take all those blogs, Freddie. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Bless you everybody that came on here. Thank you. Love y'all. I'll be in touch soon. Um, just grateful. My website's on there. Uh, 
you know, read it. Um, you know, my words cost money now. So if you want me to speak, it is what it is. FreddieShagog.com, y'all. Follow his work. And on behalf of myself and all of us at Work at Health, thank you so much for coming uh, to Freddie Chagog. What is your legacy, y'all? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bless.